There is, by times, a wonderful symmetry to life, and today is one of those days. Sophie started, out, uh, started us off this morning by noting how daunting it was to give the very first presentation to an eminent audience like you. I would argue that it's equally as daunting to give the last presentation to an eminent audience such as you, especially where you stand between the audience and their cocktail party. Sorry, no, I meant the intensive networking opportunity that's uh, about to occur afterwards. Um, last speakership is a is not a new thing to me, right? When you live in a world that's dominated by the alphabet and your last name begins with a W, you either learn to speak last or you never get to say anything at all. So I will beg your indulgence here to, to give me an opportunity to speak to a project that is an example of Canada's deep commitment to the principles, to the values, and also to the implementation of the Galway Statement, and that is the Ocean Tracking Network. Now, I just have to figure out how to advance the slides. Very good. Well, the Ocean Tracking Network is about tracking animals in the environment, the highly valued animals. Um, almost everybody in this room understands that food is an in, in incredibly important thing for human beings. There's also the recreational use of wild aquatic animals for the harvest and live release angling, for the issues revolving around tourism, the shark diving and the whale watching that's developed. You have social and ceremonial purposes for First Nations, very, very important in Canada. And there's also the ecosystem roles that such animals play. We're also working with a marine environment that, again, everybody in this room knows is changing extremely rapidly. Our growing human dependence on it is there, but we're buffering previous land impacts and depending on our future economic growth there. But in point of fact, where we're poised is really at the dawn of the second human industrial revolution. The first one happened in the 1860s on land, and associated with that was a massive decline in the biodiversity of the land with extinctions of many different species. As we develop this capability to move out there and do that in the ocean, we can either repeat that pattern or we can get to the point that we have enough information so that we can manage it. So we're not losing all of the previous benefits and values that we have there while deriving all of the other benefits that will come from the blue growth. And that's where we need to go, a much more intensive management regime. So what the Ocean Tracking Network is about is global science through shared visions and partnerships. It's about building a new ocean observing system, one that the global ocean observing system has said we need about biology. biology. We have been underrepresented in terms of looking after these kinds of things. And it's built around trying to tap into an organic growth in people who have been actually tagging with electronic tags and tracking the movements of animals. In this slide, the color patterns that you see there show all of the places in the world where telemetry is underway. Um, the different colors symbolize different things about the years in which it's been placed and, and who's doing things, but the yellow color is the one that I want to highlight to your attention here right now. And that is groups of people and all of these groups that are out there with colors are using compatible equipment, seamlessly compatible. You tag animals in one place, you can pick them up in another place with this equipment, which means that effectively we have nearly a global ocean observing system possible there if we could only get people to share data. And the yellow groups are the ones who we haven't managed to get sharing data yet. And Europe sticks out very, very strongly on that one. That is a group that we want to bring into this one. So this is a slide about the opportunity to bind these people together through the, the system, develop a new ocean observing system for biology based around the movements and animal movement of animals built on the organic growth. All of these countries that have this have been building this since the 1970s because they need it to answer regional questions. And the great beauty about getting people to share data is that the larger scale movements and the larger scale questions emerge as a consequence of meeting local needs just through the people coming forward and sharing the information that they've got. It's all about doing more with the same resources. If you just get people to share things through the internet, we can get there. So what the Ocean Tracking Network is about is looking at local to global movements and survival of ocean animals. And we use a combination of acoustic and satellite telemetry to do that, and then trying to figure out what it is in the environment that drives these distributions, the oxygens, the temperatures, the other physical variables that are out there. Once we know that, it will serve for local needs right now, but it also serves in helping to predict how this is going to change when those environmental conditions change as a function of climate change. To get to, to this and to 
oh, sorry, the animals that we track are almost anything that we can get a tag on. Um, the different groups are determined by whose interests are there. Um, ranges from lobsters and crabs to sharks to, to salmon to uh, seals in, in certain circumstances. So all of them can be tracked and seamlessly picked up by the network. And what they're doing is the network is filling biological knowledge gaps. And these knowledge gaps revolve around, around a number of different needs, which are more important in some places than others. Um, it starts with fisheries management. We can generate fisheries independent mortality estimates, something that those of you who deal with this would find very important. We can also look at cross-border movements of animals and begin to partition out the stock structures so that people can determine how many fish should go to one country or, or to another country when you're divvying up the harvest. All of this can be used for ecosystem structure and function estimates, also for looking at social interactions amongst the animals that are in the ocean. You use it to design marine protected areas. In Australia, the telemetry is wired to satellites, and we have a real-time warning system for representative white sharks and tiger sharks that are running the beaches, and there have been such a problem there. When one of these animals comes into the area, it sends a phone message out to all of the lifeguards and all of the beaches up and down this area, and the lifeguard has the opportunity to make the decision themselves about whether they clear the beach or do not clear the beach, depending on the conditions that are there at this, this time. Um, you use it for planning of coastal and offshore developments, tidal power people have used this telemetry to determine whether those animals are stumbling into the areas. We're using it to determine whether electromagnetic fields are influencing animal movements as they come across power lines moving from offshore power windmills or other systems into that. Use it for fundamental science, um, the environmental conditions, and prediction of future animal distributions. Um, in this case, one of the great things about the Ocean Tracking Network and about Canada and about the other efforts that are in Canada is that we're small enough to know that we really need each other. And when a program like MEOPAR is developed with really good modelers and really good oceanographic observing things, it behooves us to reach out, and even though it wasn't in the original proposal, to make those linkages to this. And we have now integrated ourselves, technically we have integrated ourselves with our modeling units and our te technical staff are now serving each other's equipment to try to make all of this happen. Those kinds of linkages are really, really critical and important to deliver. And at the end of the day, one of the great things about working with these animals is that it's a wonderful tool to engage the public in science. Everybody wants to know where the sharks are going. Everybody wants to know where the salmon are going and where they're present there. So how the Ocean Tracking Network works? Well, it starts down on that bottom left-hand panel as you're viewing the screen with, in this case, acoustic tags. They are surgically implanted into animals. And then they're picked up in receivers. And you see two models of receivers there. Uh, the one with the hand on it is a VR2W. That's good for about a year in the ocean. Goes out there. You don't get your data back until you retrieve it one year from the time it's placed. The unit right next to it is equipped with a six-year battery and an acoustic modem. That one, you can go out and get your data on a regular interview by steaming a ship with a hydrophone over the top of it and picking it up. What we try to do is moor these in strategic places. What you're seeing is a diagram of a line that comes out perpendicular to the coastline every 800 meters. You will see one of these acoustic receiver units so that they're overlapping in their detection range, and it serves as a gate as the animals migrate up and down through the coastal zone and are picked up. For places where we can't hope to hold acoustic moored facilities in place because the trawler fleet is just going to tear them to pieces faster than we can put them out there. Um, we have mobile platforms, things like wave gliders and the Slocum Sea Gliders that can go out and can be set to patrol those areas and pro provide that kind of coverage. Put all of that together, we can get to the point that we can do a pretty good job of covering an area. So here, for one example, is what happens in the Scotian Shelf and St. Lawrence area for our and Gulf of Maine area. Um, as you look there, and I do have a pointer here, off of Halifax, you find something that we call the Halifax line. That's the world's longest telemetry line. It comes out over 100 nautical miles with one acoustic receiver every 800 meters, 254 of them in total. That's picking up. That's picking up the movements of animals between U.S. waters and Canadian waters. Things like bluefin tuna that come through and move back and forth and feeding that data back. We have similar blocking lines to enter into the Gulf of St. Lawrence, so anything that goes in and out of the Gulf can be picked up. And all the rest of the red lines or red dots that you see there are sort of deployments of opportunities. They are places where people have meteorological buoys or other, other kinds of facilities that we can attach at very little cost, an acoustic receiver unit, and increase the granularity and the scale on which we can detect animals and the temporal scale that, that's present there. 
still leaves some big blue gaps where we can't cover things, and that's where we do things like harness seals. We actually really like seals in Canada, and in this particular case, those seals are carrying mobile acoustic receivers. The course tracks that you see here show where they're going after they've been released from Sable Island, and you see that they fill in a huge gap in the area where I can't cover with fixed receivers, and they report in real time through the satellite systems. So what we have is abilities to build up this kind of coverage and get the, uh, the grain that we need. We also need to provide oceanographic uh, and data infrastructure to support the whole effort. We do a bit of environmental monitoring ourselves. We have gliders, slocum for profiling, and liquid robotics wave gliders to do surface kinds of activities. We have benthic oceanographic pods that are put out there. But the real power in what we do is by associating our deployments with national oceanographic authorities' deployments. In, all over the world, where we go and we place our equipment, we try to find those monitoring systems that are already in place. And that's where you get the data from to, to try to link this together. And again, this one ties back into to things like the Mio part. We also have a data warehouse that stores all of our tracking data. This is now recognized as an associated data unit of the International Oceanographic Data Exchange. In other words, we are up there with the best standards globally and recognized and feeding into that global ocean observing system. So it's a system that's in place and easily exportable to others who want to get into the game. So what that means is OTN and the Shared Atlantic Ocean, we're partnered with government, academia, the NGO sector and industry. And this is across, I think it's 42 countries now in which we're operating where we have members that come in. Certainly in Canada, our primary partner is the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Um, we are a pilot project and system of the Global Ocean Observing System. So we were, from our conception, designed to try to come in there and fill this gap in the biological oceanographic mon uh, biological monitoring that was needed in the oceans. We are, as I mentioned, an associated data unit of the IODE. And in terms of Horizon 2020, we're a member of the Atlantos project, something called the European Animal Telemetry Network. Our lead PI on that is Pedro Afonso from Portugal. What this basically boils down to is we have identified over 800 investigators in Europe that are actually operating all of this seamlessly compatible equipment, and none of them are talking to each other. I actually had a horrifying experience where I gave a talk in Bergen, Norway, to a, a group there, and two gentlemen who for five years had been tracking the same species in the same fjord and putting receivers within 300 meters of each other didn't actually know that they were each doing that in that particular place. So that's a terrible wasted effort, and that's the kind of thing that we need to get away from, but also bring together this, this larger conglomeration of data so that we can do some that, um, special things. Now, I mentioned earlier the buoys of opportunity. Probably the most exciting ones that we're developing now for a capacity for the global world are on the Parada buoy networks. That has already happened, and I have three sets of heroes I need to identify here. When we first discovered the opportunity, it was about three weeks or so before the first the Parado turnover cruises were going. And I first approached Paulo Nobre in Brazil to see if this was happening. He became my first hero and champion that made the introductions. After that, Bernard Borles from France was an absolute gem in terms of helping us to bring all of these things together. And Noah handled all the technical components and, and helped us enormously with this. The end result of that is we now have a barrier line that comes across on Parada and is carrying over now into the Indian Ocean. So we're starting to do the Ramabui network as we speak now and that's going to be an incredibly powerful tool for this global network that wants to look at these, these movements of these particular animals. And to give you just a flavor of some of the things that the Ocean Tracking Network does and some of the recent results, we had a wonderful presentation earlier here about the American eels going to the uh, Sargasso Sea. We actually don't actually know that because nobody's ever gotten to that until like last week. Um, what happened here was an initial study started by the Department of Fisheries and Oceans in association with researchers in Laval University in Quebec, where there was a terrible decline in eel abundance in the Gulf of St. Lawrence system, better than 90% decline over a 10-year period. In other words, triggering all of the alarm bells about threatened species. Wanted to find out what was happening in the ocean that could potentially be contributing to this, so a bunch of these animals were acoustically and satellite tagged and released into the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and the end result of that was 100% of at least the satellite tagged animals never made it out of the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Instead, they found themselves inside the stomach of the threatened poor beagle sharks. Now, that didn't actually make 
Department of Fisheries and Oceans life any simpler as they try to figure out which threatened species deserves better treatment under those particular circumstances and try to develop a plan that comes forward. But it, it was better to have the information. And then what it drove into was a new project that began by capturing the eels in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and they were put in a bus. And the bus took them around the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and they were released off the coast of Nova Scotia again earlier in, uh, or in summer 2014 with their satellite tags, and those tags, one of them anyway, made it all the way to the Sargasso Sea. So we've now managed to document that and pulled up all that information. The paper by Big UA et al. is submitted into science. Fingers crossed that that will be coming out. Second was a technological innovation that I'd like to mention. It's very, very expensive as everybody in this room knows, to get an oceanographic vessel. For me to attend the Halifax line, the vessels can cost as much as $23,000 a day to go to do that. We began working with our wave glider to see whether we could tame this machine to get it to the point that maybe it could do the servicing and, and the uploading of the materials. That involved bringing Canadian firms into association with the international manufacturers of the wave glider, getting them to work collaboratively and launch it out. Uh, after one or two false starts, this year we managed to tend that entire Halifax line, 150, sorry, 250 units, using the wave glider alone, taking my ship time cost from $23,000 a day to $250 a day. And the wave glider was able to operate in 7 to 10 meter waves when the ship could not to do the same kinds of things. So that is probably the future, and that is one of the great messages that we can bring forward about how we can actually do, this, do, um, do more with the same, I guess is how I would describe that one. Um, and I would also mention that the OTN has got a review article about its telemetry work under uh, second review in science. We hope that that will be coming out very soon. All that does is just raise the profile. It indicates that yes, this is something that the world does want and does need. So in terms of the future, um, we, we recognize that there's a great opportunity here to make progress, but it's going to have to be through true partnerships. Um, we've had a lot of, of give and take with, with groups over the times, and sometimes you end up in a room where people talk to you and nobody's actually talking with you. It's talking at you about what's going to happen. There's a tremendous amount of work that has to go into developing these true partnerships and work that way. So it's going to require good, good faith and good will on everybody in this room to actually make this happen, and a whole lot of patience and a whole lot of work. There is an increased attention to maximizing benefits from the infrastructures that are out there. In my case, from the beginning, we've been looking for these platforms of opportunity. Can we extend and, and get more coverage by, by using those at, at limited cost? So this is, this is very important. We ourselves are going to extend our operating networks by adding passive acoustics onto it to meet the needs of a whole other community. We're already going out into the places where they need it monitored. It doesn't really take much more for us to drop those systems in there and get them back again when we come out and, and collect it at the time. We need better integration of our data infrastructures, not only the things that I collect, but how do I take my telemetry data and overlie it against acidification data or all of the other things that people are going to have to, to overlay it with. That's going to be a big, big task. And then at the end of the day, everybody is focused on providing the information that's going to enable the new blue growth while preserving the current base of activities up there. And that is probably the greatest challenge that we all face here. So with that, thank you very much. You were very patient to sit through all of this way. I've got a whole lot of new friends, clearly. <laughs> thank you.